Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is the 6th of March, uh, 2013, and we are uh, converting youth culture tonight. Uh, youth converts culture. Um, and uh, and we have uh, the sponsors, the founders, the uh, uh, creators of, of that project, which I think it was a, would you call it a summer camp um, or time that's, with students? <laughs> that's definitely how it manifested itself first in the public mm -hmm. eye, yes. Um, we started from, um, basically I, I presented to Alabama Leadership class a video called I'm Human a couple of years ago or a year and a half ago. And from that, um, it went really well. And then Kathy Gassenheimer here in Alabama connected Beth and me. And uh, we hit it off right away um, and haven't stopped haven't slowed down since and we developed youth converts culture uh, directly after that so great thank you that was Daniel Witt uh, Daniel um, do you want to uh, um, Monica I, I don't I'm um, feel free to you know interrupt me here <laughs> as we do introductions but um, Monica has invited uh, these folks um, and you'll have to tell about your connections a little bit but Daniel go ahead and um, introduce yourself a little bit more okay yeah. Um, so I'm Daniel Witt. I'm 32. I live in actually live in Athens, Alabama, which is all the way at the top. Uh, I teach in Madison City Schools, which is uh, basically a suburb of the Huntsville area. So Beth and I are actually almost two hours apart, and so we we keep this thing alive online. I mean, just all the time. We we meet together less than once a month, um, but we keep it alive. And then Jonathan's another two hours away from us, so we kind of form a two-hour triangle. Um, and uh, I teach, right now I teach one block of broadcast journalism at my school, and then right after that I co-teach a, um, a multimedia design class, and then I'm a digital multimedia, uh, I'm sorry, a digital media specialist the rest of the day, so um, I'm not a librarian, I'm not focused, I'm not centered in the library, but I, I handle all digital it's a brand new school we just opened this year, so it's super high tech, and so I'm responsible for all things electronic and digital inside that building, which keeps me busy. Yeah. Um, What's the so, name of the school or the focus? Or? Uh, the name of the school is James Clemens High School. It took half of Bob Jones, which you may or may not have heard of, um, and it is, uh, I mean, it is Alabama's best shot at a 21st century high school. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's and it's going pretty well. What we find is it's not about the tools, it's not about the tech, it's about the mindset of the people inside the building, and so that's what we really battle all day, every day, is that mindset. Very cool. Great introduction. Thank you. Um, Beth, do you want to introduce yourself? You were on one other time, but um, yeah. And and at that time we said we need to get back to find out more about youth converts culture. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, finally, we're getting here. So thank you for coming on. Awesome, um, Beth Sanders. <laughs> Since Daniel said his age, I'll say my age. Um, we're twenty six. <laughs> uh, I teach. I'm not going to, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I teach um, social studies. I teach ninth and eleventh grade at Tarrant High School. We are. Um, nestled in Birmingham. We are 99% free and reduced lunch. We are also a one-to-one -one MacBook and iTouch school um, in my third year of teaching and uh, believe strongly in passion-based learning, inquiry-based learning, um, creation-based learning, not even so much project but just like the idea of creating um, and that can be creating something that's written or some huge masterpiece but um, I'm finding that creation makes more sense to me than project. Um, have 140 students. Uh, we are paperless and we move a lot. And how many students have, again? Did you say? I have, a, I have 140 students between. Oh, you and personally do. Okay. Yeah, okay. and um, we. Um, I, I guess as, that's as far as my classroom goes. We're I'm using Twitter as a Twitter is a really important tool right now for us to kind of be global and locally connected. So our, our student, my student's hashtag is SandersTHS. Um, so I'm kind of, Daniel and I are both really exploring the power of social media to empower genuine student voice. Um, his, his classroom's hashtag is Jets Press. Um, I'm also a technology consultant for Alabama Best Practices Center. 
and doing some digital organizing with IDEA, which is how Monica and I were initially linked. Um, and I think that's, and then Youth Converts Culture is <laughs> a, a large par portion of where uh, Daniel and I are kind of just trying to figure out how to, we, we're we kind of saying now, you know, our thing has kind of been for a while bridging the gap between technology and humanity. Um, we are strong advocates for empathy um, in the classroom and in the world, and we are strong advocates for what we call technology equality. So uh, arguing that access is a survival need for people of our world. So, and by access, we mean access to a digital device and to a Wi-Fi connection and um, to each other. So that's kind of my blurb. Um, I had a question from the chat room, Beth. Uh, okay. What t uh, school do you teach at again? It's Tarrant High School, T-A-R-R-A-N-T, -R -R and okay. it's in Birmingham, Alabama. Great. Ow, welcome back. Um, <laughs> But uh, introduce yourself, if you would. What okay, have you my name been up is to uh, Al Elliott. Uh, I'm a fifth grade educator at uh, Green Valley Elementary School in Hoover, Alabama. Uh, I'm a graduate student uh, at uh, UAB. I'm uh, in the uh, PhD program, Early Childhood. Um, I, uh, I started this uh, Monday Eve discussion concept, which basically, in short, I invented a holiday. Uh, the first Monday of every month, I think, should be looked <laughs> upon as a time for teachers to enter into the classroom energetic and ready to try something new that they've learned with their kids and so to help celebrate that holiday on the eve of that Monday uh, we all meet up and have a discussion a Monday Eve discussion uh, Paul was uh, he was gracious enough to uh, bless us with his presence in it uh, and so that's 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 kind of um, what I'm trying to do I'm a technology enthusiast um, and then pretty much my, my dissertation is basically um, discovering uh, the best ways to integrate technology in the early childhood elementary setting. So I have genuine interest in it. Uh, and that's kind of my passion, and I'm happy to be here. Great. Monica, do you want to jump in? Sure. Um, Monica Hardy in <coughs> Loveland, Colorado, um, where we are experimenting with the intersection of city and school. Met Beth um, in Vermont in the fall um, at Idea Camp. Um, I'm part of the organizing team for IDEC, which is the conference that will be in at CU Boulder, August 4th through 8th. Um, just blown away by her energy and um, asked them to join us this week because they just returned from um, sharing a lot of what they're doing at Harvard. So, and so I've, because of Beth, um, met Daniel and I'm um, happy to to meet you as well, Al. Nice to meet you too. Chris, final yeah, introduction. My name is Chris Sloan and I uh, teach high school media and English at Judge Memorial in Salt Lake City, Utah. So that's kind of me in a nutshell. <laughs> Were you going to tell us your age? Oh, uh, I'm still 51, so <laughs> although 52 is on the horizon here. So how long have you been 51? No, just, <laughs> just. So is that take, taking that joke and, and to a serious, uh, serious question here, um, the other day I was describing how um, we're, I'm sometimes concerned about how many, when we look down at the bottom of our, our screen, um, how many of us are over 50? Right or or of the older generation, and and maybe that's just because that's who we know kind of thing, and that's what happens. You know, who knows how that happens? But um, and what I said at the time to the person to the person sitting at the table with me was was uh, you know it'd be nice to have uh, some of the younger teachers on too to talk about and and to kind of share those perspectives. So I was just wondering. Um, Beth and Daniel, do you think there is a different perspective between those of us who are uh, sort of a little older and younger teachers, or how do you see that? Jam out, Daniel. Since, Daniel, <laughs> since you, you started it by saying your name, your age there. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, I shouldn't have gone there, huh? No, nah, it's okay. Um, it's interesting. So th the question is, is there a different perspective based on age and generation here? Yeah. Oh well, yeah, I think so. Um, I think there are those of us and those of you who stick with it and make a real bona fide effort to to um, focus and 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 pay attention to what's going on 
and empathize with our kids, with our youth, um, to see where they're at, where they live. Um, and I say where they live because they live online so often. Um, and so I do find that there's a gigantic generational chasm. In fact, I think inside under one roof, there's often four very, very different um, generations trying to coexist and trying to learn together. So if you take um, like my daughter Stella, who's five, you know, she's, um, she's a mobile native she learned her alphabet and her colors and how to spell her sight words on my iPhone driving to Mississippi. And then you take the students that I work with every day, and maybe even Beth, maybe even me, um, call us digital natives. And then I consider myself, honestly, a millennial, somebody who kind of developed a moral code prior to the Internet, somebody who developed a, a habit code prior to the Internet, uh, and then sort of moved into it. And then I guess some people call those dim digital immigrants. And then we have um, kind of everyone else. And I don't know what to call those people. Um, I've heard them referred to as traditional learners, which I don't really like. Um, but, you know, at my, at my high school, I think I have all four of those represented, trying to learn, trying to teach, all at one time. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it's the policymaker down to the mobile native inside the same room. Um, and so... Yeah, I think it's I think it's a gigantic thing, and it's it's the first time in human history we've ever had to cross that gap. Um, I could talk, Beth. You want to talk more about the differences? Uh, I think I I think that we both kind of have that same view, but I I do think that it's it goes back to that thing Daniel and I have kind of been reflecting on where we're at post Harvard, and Daniel wrote this really beautiful reflection I think on the plane. Um, on the way back and we started out that summer camp with the question are you open so what I'm finding that breaks the age barrier that breaks the um, generational barrier is that openness to adapt and um, be aware of all those differences that Daniel just described and I think I think regardless of age if you're open to adapting to whatever works best and makes sense for the learner um, of today then then I will jam with you forever. Absolutely, and I, I think um, what there was there were three lines. Like openness is more important than intelligence. Mm -hmm. Awareness is more important than education, and I don't know what else I said. Empathy is more important than accreditation or something like that. But that's what we're finding. We're finding the people who can really hang with this complex generational gap that we've got. Those people who really hang are those people who remain open on a day-to-day, -day, moment to moment basis, it's the key. And so, you know, if you if you set root in, in a strategy, if you lay down your roots with a technique or with an idea in your classroom, then you've already lost. Um, and so it's, it's all about staying extremely transient. It's all about um, not attaching yourself to what you think works, because what works today doesn't work tomorrow. And if you're willing to do that, uh, on the age, I'm I'm 40 years old, uh, so I don't know if I'm old yet or not, but I I, I think so. Um, but but the whole thing, like the, the term or the phrase "digital native," I mean, a couple years ago in the class, I heard, I forgot who coined the phrase. I know she wrote a book and kind of mentioned it. Uh, but I I just think about like, and, and I'm only I'm using myself as an example. I've always been like a nerd. Like I didn't just buy these glasses because I thought they were interesting. I've had them, before, you know. I'm a nerd for real. I don't just look like one. But I've always been into technology, and so a digital native. I, I think that some people that are that are older and are kind of staying abreast with what's going on, it's not that they're staying abreast with what's new. They've always been interested in, you know, like I, I can remember having an email account and not having anybody to email. Because it was kind of like everybody else was like, what are you doing? And then I can remember when I first had a website, I first had a blog, and I was trying to get people that I knew that were either my age or younger at the time to log on and read it, and they were still getting newspapers. So to me, like digital native, a, a lot of the students that I have, they've grown up with, with devices and whatnot, but they haven't really grown up applying them or using them as tools. They've grown up using them as toys. So like to me, I, 
all technology that I'm interested in most of the time is, is a tool or a way to apply it. And I think that a lot of older people, or any person at all, if that's how you're looking at the, the devices or the computers or the tablets that you're using, that's what keeps your interest, the application. I think a lot of time, like if a teacher is given an iPad and they don't really know the application within the classroom, it's not that they don't want to use it. They don't know how to use it. You know what I mean? And, and they really and, and if they're not open to, to agree with you, then, then they're not even interested in seeing how we can. But most of the people that I've had contact with, even if they're not digital natives or they're not of it, once they understand the application of certain things, they, they, are, they become more open. And, and so I, I think the, the age difference, I, I think, is more so older people are more practical. And a lot of times I've seen people that have iPads and, and, and they're trying to do the neatest thing they can do and not necessarily teach, but they're trying to wow their kids. Like, listen, if you look through the iPad, it look like a picture is over there floating in the air. And I'm thinking, well, what are you teaching by wowing them with that or whatever? So I think like the application piece kind of transcends the age a little bit. Mm -hmm. I, I think another word that I like for open is alive. And I think we're in such an interesting time right now that it's, it's almost like you kind of have to be alive. <laughs> you know, we could be not alive for quite a while. Um, Mary Catherine Bateson writes about being in the vulnerability of context. And I think we're, we're getting the affordance of it's almost a necessity to be alive and, and, and be in that. So um, I love the things that you're saying. Why, why don't you guys dive in and give us the lowdown on this weekend? The lowdown on Harvard? Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, I assume, assume we know nothing about it because people listening probably don't. Yeah. So and maybe that, that will allow us to trace back to the summer too as well. Okay, cool. Okay. So um, the name of the conference was the Alumni of Color Conference, and it's the 11th annual um, conference that they've had there. Um, the, uh, the slogan for the conference was the revolution will be live. Um, the, the primary focus of this conference is, um, has to do with racial equality and um, um, mobility in general, human mobility and the ability to transcend circumstance. And so I think Beth and I kind of latched onto that really quickly. Um, Perry County works really well for that. If you don't know much about Perry County, in a nutshell, um, to the naked eye, someone like me who moved from New York City down to Madison, Alabama, it looks segregated. Um, it's what it looks like. It's um, the, the public high school there is almost completely black and the private high school there is almost completely white. And so that wasn't our motivation for going there. There are lots of other things there. There are lots of other reasons to go there. Um, but it did become an issue, and our, our job there, and I'll, I've got to go to Perry County before I can tell you about Harvard, honestly. So we, we kind of went to Perry County with the intention of using devices and using connectivity to help them tell their story and to help them transcend where they were, to try to think bigger, to try to reach further, and to try to um, connect outside of where they were because it's so, it feels so closed off. Um, but as you guys know as well as I do, I mean, the Internet's totally killed that. We're not closed off. It just feels that way. So anyway, we were a good fit for Harvard. We wrote a proposal. We worked really hard on it. We get there. Um, we, we worked terribly hard to prepare um, an attractive, reasonable way to present this in a small amount of time. And we get there for our hour and a half panel. And um, we, we did our best. And we had some really cool folks in there. We had high school kids in there from the Boston area, which is really probably my favorite part about it. Um, we had some teachers there. Um, we had some, maybe some grad students um, from Harvard. Um, and I'm not, there were a couple of other floaters in there. I'm not sure who else was in there. there were, um, but in a nutshell, um, what we learned was just because it's, you know, just because it's one of the best schools in the country doesn't mean that they get it yet. Um, we saw we saw some opposition to some ideas. We saw some things that that Beth and Beth and I just walk around with this knowledge. It feels like knowledge to us. It's not an idea. It's reality, you know. And so we then we go share this idea, and and then we we realize, wow, you know, um, maybe maybe there's less of us than we thought, or 
or maybe we've got to reach further. Maybe we've got to work harder. Well, we know we have to work harder. Beth, help me out. Piggyback here, please. Um, what do you want to, Paul? Do you want me to talk specifically about the camp or what happened at Harvard, or does it matter? It sounds like we're going back and forth, which is fine. Yeah, do what do what you're comfortable with. Um, so maybe just a quick thing. So we. It kind of started out as a 21st century summer camp. So what they at, when Daniel presented before, this was last summer, right? Yeah. So what you've done it one time? Is that right? Yeah, we've the okay. inaugural camp. So okay. when Daniel presented to Leadership Alabama, their their argument to him was, well, you can do that with do this with affluent kids. You can make these really powerful student created things, um, but you can't do it um, with the average. Alabama student and Kathy Gassenheimer's argument was well Beth Sanders is doing this in Tarrant so that's kind of where the where it became this idea that whether our students are affluent or whether our students are living in poverty or whether you know they have these complex issues that they're dealing with um, they still need the space um, and the support to use the devices that they have um, to connect to themselves, to connect to the world, to connect to each other. And Daniel and I were really adamant in going into Perry County that we didn't want to tell a story that was ours. We wanted to go in and support them to tell their own story, which is something we also try to promote in our classrooms. Um, so Perry County, well, and Daniel and I both kind of get labeled because we're digital natives or millennials as techie teachers, um, which I think Al was kind of hitting on this, but it's not, you know, and Sir Ken Robinson says this really well, it's not about the technology itself. It's about what great teachers can do with the technology. That's what makes great learning. And, and that's what Bert's, and Youth Convert's culture why. slogan is, is it's not about technology, it's about empowerment. Right. So, and so there were two reasons that the conference made sense to us. Once, one, because we are um, advocates for what, you know, t real learning in the 21st century, real learning for people today, not using this industrial model um, that doesn't work and isn't working. That's the first thing. And second, for equity for all students for all students regardless of where they are and for us technology is a way to make that happen um, so we and we believe strongly we're both you know heavily influenced by Mark Prensky who wrote Digital Natives Partnering for Real Learning heavily influenced by Tony Wagner creating innovators heavily influenced by Seth Godin and his idea of what art and artists are so we're taking all of those ideas into youth converts culture and we took all of those ideas into our presentation at Harvard um, and I, I do think that, and we're still grappling with what happened, but the two most powerful things for me were, and I wish that Jonathan was here, but um, what is... Jonathan it, is, is a senior... Um, he's a senior at Francis Marion, and he ironically has applied and had an interview with Harvard. Um, and... Francis Marin is is the school where most of the students came from, or mm -hmm. for they the came summer. From Francis Marion High School and RC Hatch, which are both in Perry County, um, mm -hmm. they're rivals. They're about twenty miles away. Francis Marion High School's graduation rate is like right at fifty percent, and RC Hatch is a little below that. Um, mm -hmm. Very rural. Um, and is by the way, uh, where you're where you come from, is that considered success or not? I joke because there, there, um, there was a, an article in the paper about a Bronx school that oh. graduation rate was thirty three percent, and they oh. were comparing it to schools where it was fifty percent. As you know, those are the successful schools, and I'm okay. like, really? Um, <laughs> but, well, yeah. and then I think we could get into are our high schools um, really does graduation mean success, or does it just mean that you've passed right. this graduation exam? Sure. Which I also wish that Jonathan was here because he's been doing a lot of work since Youth Converts Culture with the board at Perry County, him and Javarius, who is also a part of the camp and is also a part of IDEA, um, are really going in. They went into a board meeting, and this is just, this is important because Jonathan brought it up at Harvard. Um, he's talking to graduate level um, people that are going to become teachers and saying, hey, this is what's happening in Perry County, Alabama, and you may have never heard of us, but I have real opinions about the grad exam. I have real opinions about standardized tests. Um, I have real opinions about what learning should look like for people my age and that to me within our presentation like Daniel and I just sat down and we were live tweeting we were tweeting with people um, who were following our presentation but Jonathan had space to talk and to say what he wanted to say and connect with people um, 
who who care about what he has to say. So that's it. That's another and, huge part of what technology can do. Javarius skyped in um, and got to talk and connect with people as well. But yeah, that that idea that people not everybody's getting it. The only thing on our name tags at Harvard were our names, our titles, and the hashtag for the conference. The keynote opening speaker. There were over a hundred people there. Six people were tweeting. Three of them were from Youth Converts Culture. Uh, people are missing this way to connect um, ideas, and that so that's it's not about the tools, but it is about what the tools can do to connect us to each other and to ideas, and not thinking that there's this one way to do something. I'd like to I'd like to jump in and and sort of reiterate um, the importance of Jonathan. Um, when we were when we were presenting, we, you know, we had already rehearsed. Jonathan knew when and where he got to speak um, for his long block of time during our presentation. And what we found was, just like we found with every young person we've ever worked with, and I was this way too, um, that student voice is is really unharnessed. Student voice is really raw. Student voice is really unclear until they get a chance to practice it, until they get a chance to to work through it. And when he, I'll just give you an idea. Say he had 15 minutes to talk. He took all 15. The first five minutes were hit and miss because he was finding himself. He was finding his voice. And then he hit this beautiful moment. It was a real stride. And when he hit that stride, um, it was total clarity. Nothing came out of his mouth that was false or in any way inaccurate, and he really started nailing things. And so, such, such as, can we hear like what? What are some? What's some of the content? And we 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 were hoping he'd be with us. I'll right. say again. And if you're, and I, you know, I, <laughs> but, I hate but, yeah. to, I hate to represent him like this, but I I know pretty. I think we both Best know we pretty well do. what yeah. he said. Um, First of all, he he began to say very clearly how he felt about standardized tests. Um, he also spoke very, very uh, adamantly about um, – Beth, what was another major piece? I think one aha moment for him when we were talking through it, um, he said – that this isn't manifest destiny, this is manifest equity. When we asked him what Youth Converts culture meant to him, he said, this isn't manifest destiny, this is manifest equity. Yeah. And then... God, I mean, the guy, you know, he's taking one of the coolest phrases in history and is loaded. And one of the most, yeah, but also loaded phrases in history yeah. when you think about what that means. And he's reapplying it. He's synthesizing his own idea from that into a into a vision of his future, into a vision of our future. And what he's basically saying with that is that technology is the thing that's going to bring equity. It's and not quite, the, it's not there yet, but it's, it's the key. It's the thing that allows us all to transcend circumstance. It's the thing that allows us to reach out beyond where we are and find people like this. It's the thing that allows us to share our ideas. And he's finding his voice online. Um, but and and a lot a lot of youth are beginning to find their voice online, especially when they're being guided in a public school by someone like Beth um, or you guys. Um, but we still feel that there's this human piece, you know. I want to say one more thing about what Jonathan you. said on the street that we were presenting on. There were all these banners on the street lights, and Jonathan stopped Daniel. And this is just just that disconnect of six to eight years of age, like Jonathan stopped and recognized this sign way before we did. And every single banner around the Graduate School of Education at Harvard says education is a civil right. So Jonathan literally stops and we all stop. And even just this imagery that Daniel and I are standing behind him and he's looking up and reading that. Um, and he never, we, we spoke about it on the street, but then when he was talking during his part in the presentation, he said, and I want you guys all to look outside. He said, look at that banner. He said, it says education is a civil right. But you know what I'm realizing? A great education is a civil right. And that's when he went into what he sees are the injustices happening in public schools. And he spoke his own truth and gave specific examples about the injustices he's feeling and then spoke on these two things that he's a part of, which is his role in Youth Converts Culture and then his role in IDEA because he's the youth fellow for the Institute for Democratic Education this year. Um, and that's really when he had that aha movement. And I mean, 
thinking about what that means and even that Harvard, maybe you got it wrong and you need to add a word into your sign and, you know, this kid wants to go to school there and how lucky are you to have his voice and that without, yeah, without some of the tech tools, the only reason Jonathan got into the camp is because he Twitter bombed Daniel and I to such an amount that I was crying and went up to Thomas and was like, Thomas, take my stipend because we were full. Um, I said, Thomas, take my stipend. Um, we're not going to do the camp without Jonathan. He won't stop tweeting me. Daniel and I have a feeling about him. Um, and it, I mean, he's a, it's just, you got to go. And that's human connection. But the human connection was created through the tool. He never would have got to us without the tool. We still have our hearts in it, which is where empathy is so critical to our work. But without Twitter and without the technical part of it, you, it our, we wouldn't have known each other. So can you say more details about um, how you got funding, how how long the camp was? There were six teachers there as well, I think, um, yeah, whether we they were millennials or some of we, us old folks. Or <laughs> we had yeah. we had six six educators. Um, there was a there was an administrator there, and the rest were teachers. Um, and then there were twenty seven students, uh, three of which were not accepted originally. We had a long waiting list. There were three. Jonathan was not the only one that we squeezed in at the last minute. There was another one named Jalen and another one named John Jerica. And uh, they they ended up being like amazing assets. You said 27 students? 27 students That's and a lot. six yeah. educators. Uh, the funding happened after I presented I'm Human, um, which you can find on Madison City Schools uh, YouTube or on Youth Converts Cultures uh, website. Um, after I presented that and and the, the, I'd like to reiterate also that the discussion that the guy that he called me out on, he said, yeah, you can do that because you teach in an affluent school. I asked him to kind of look in his pockets and take out his phone, and he did. And I said, those are the same optics that we used to shoot I'm Human. And so that's, that's kind of when the aha moment happened. And something really magical happened in that room. It was a room full of dignitaries called Leadership Alabama, uh, maybe 50 or 60 people. And Kathy Gassenheimer, with her amazingly persuasive language and presence, kind of um, over the next two or three weeks had connected Beth and me and also helped through them to raise money, one participant at a time. So these would be like business owners, maybe a couple of superintendents and so forth. And they just began to donate $1,000, $2,000. $3,000 and before long we had about $30,000 and with that money we were able to um, to go down um, support ourselves feed the kids and find the space and rock out for five or six straight days we also secured a place to do a final culminating event where we invited dignitaries uh, citizens of the city parents whoever wanted to come other students and we opened up this giant forum in like a Harvard style room uh, where we presented our products, we presented our final outcomes, we presented the students and their ideas and our ideas. Um, and so that's that's where the, the funding came from. Mm -hmm. And we're still very, very adamantly looking for situations like that. Again, that was very serendipitous. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm but, wondering what kind of legs it has. Like, are you going to be able to do it again or, yeah? God, I hope so, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know. I know we will do it again. Right now, what we're kind of perusing is the idea of uh, of doing some things a little bit more locally, so that so it's not as expensive, um, so that we don't have to have hotel rooms and the whole thing. Um, so that can help us kind of grow our base a little bit. Um, we're also looking at going directly to superintendents of school systems um, to sort of sell this idea. Mm -hmm. um, and another really important piece that needs to be mentioned here is that this was more than just a partnership between us and those people who came to our camp. What ended up happening was um, my admin, my principal and my school system allowed me to take Madison City School owned iPads and then um, Beth's school system and principal allowed her to take Tarrant High School's uh, iPod touches and some MacBooks to help support this effort. And so it really became a partnership between three school systems, Perry County Schools, Madison City Schools, and Tarrant City Schools. And so really what we're pushing maybe bigger than anything in the world is partnerships. Mm -hmm. um, our presentation was very, very, very heavy on, on partnerships. Partnerships between a person and himself. And Monica, you're a huge influence there. Um, I talk to my kids all the time about talking to yourself. Um, 
And so that partnership, then a partnership between someone and another person, and then a partnership between that person and his or her device, and then finally a partnership between a person and his or her world. And so these partnerships is what, these are the things that are driving this innovation. And without them, we wouldn't be able to have flourished for that week or since then. So, Beth, maybe our um, since you, you've been talking a little bit, uh, Daniel, and um, but maybe break down each day. Oh, those are great principles. Like, what did day one look like? What did day two look like? What did what did what did it look like in the classroom? So we were or doing, if it was a classroom. <laughs> yeah, so we were in the basement of Judson College in Alabama in July without air conditioning. So we had fans, mm -hmm. but we had the fastest Wi-Fi ever. Um, so we were making it work. How did um, you have fast Wi-Fi? No uh, one we was on it. <laughs> oh, 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 because it was the summertime. Yeah, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's no one there. Um, so, and can, can I ask though, in in general, in Perry County, is what's what's what is connection like for the students? They have, they don't have open Wi-Fi, but they have Wi-Fi at both high schools. They're not open. We're still pushing to have open access. And so what about at home? Do they have good connection? Um, no. The, the average median income in Perry County, which Jonathan said this in his speech, was is a little under 11,000 a household. So they're, I mean, they're dealing with extremities. But even within that, like Comcast and Tarrant, we're working to do this in Tarrant as well, but Comcast just opened up a new option for low-income housing to get Wi-Fi access at a really affordable rate. So there's really cool things like that that are happening. I was just put in connection with two different organizations, which I can tweet later, that are doing um, kind of like secondhand technology to low-income mm -hmm. communities. Because one of the questions Daniel and I got from a teacher, which I'm at our Harvard presentation, which I'm connected with her on Twitter now, is how to get devices in her students' hands. Um, so and that's what we mean by a partnership. Um, you know, you make these connections and you keep these connections with people. I think Monica and I's relationship is a clear representation of that. Um, when you when you meet someone who believes in your ideas and who believes in their ideas, you you have to hold on to them. And um, so that's been really critical for Perry County. We're we're in Twitter contact with all of the kids there, so uh, we know what's going on, and we you know we try to support them the best way we can if we can't get physically there. Um, I just put a link in the chat. Each day at the camp, we made a vlog at the end of the day. So one of our big pushes is um, helping our students not be consumers of the Internet, but creators, content creators. And um, ironically, was watching the South by Southwest uh, hashtag today, Al, and was um, watching a person from the STEAM, the big STEAM push, talk about that idea of students being content creators. So that's, I think, really something really important to say. Um, day one was all about getting to know each other and getting to know ourselves. One of our favorite activities we did was, um, we call it, uh, I think we call it What's Your Baggage, but we asked the kids, we just had markers and whiteboards, and we said, who are you on the inside? Who do you think you're perceived as on the outside? Um, what drives you or motivates you? And then what's your baggage? After each time they wrote on the board, they looked at each other in the eye and they said, I hear you. And they had a conversation about it. They switched boards, wrote on each other's boards. So a lot of um, really, what I call emotional <laughs> emotional activities and Daniel and I both do these with our students and Seth Godin argues for emotional labor um, to really be someone who's a change agent so it was a lot of that and then at the end of that day and a lot of supporting the kids to use the devices we made Twitter accounts the first day we Twitter bombed people to get them to follow our hashtag we Skyped with a professor and we Skyped with Daniel's friend in New York who's a content creator Kathy Gassenheimer Skyped in we got into small groups and had discussions about what matters to them, what matters um, to them locally, what story do they want to tell. So did a lot of activities like that on day one and day two. Um, the end of day one. I have one a was, question. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Good. You know, the content creator stuff that you mentioned, um, I kind of wanted to hear you say a little bit more about that because on the site, there's some really compelling um, videos um, like the um, the thing about there's a Coney response or something that says because I'm a kid. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot you know you've been saying about the connectedness uh, that you're introducing to the students and helping them live with. But um, these content creations, um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about you know um, some of the ones that really stand out and maybe um, what's the goal of the students or um, 
you know, what has become of some of those things, because I, I see that some of them have quite a few views. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, content creation, um, it, it's, it's what I do in general. It's, it's what I do. It's what my students and I do together. Um, it's an attempt to practice being connected. Um, sometimes, sometimes we have to kind of search for things that we know that we can connect to. And when we find that thing, we just run full steam ahead with it. So in the instance of Coney, I mean, Coney, you know, took the world over. It was, it was the ultimate content creation for YouTube at that time. It kind of still is. And so when they released Move, um, we immediately the next day jumped on it, wrote a script, filmed it, edited it, and had it out before lunch. So that was all the, like, it came out at 11 p.m. And it was, it was our response was out by 11 a.m. Um, and so we find, first of all, to get our voices heard, we have to jump on waves as they're going. Mm -hmm. So that's a big piece to content creation. Um, if, if you want your ideas to go viral, because we do, um, you have to jump on those waves when they happen. Otherwise, you're manufacturing your own wave, which can be done and which people do. Uh, and but I, it's, a little, um, from, it's a little bit harder. And hard. I think another thing is also, um, and I do, you know, one thing that I do in my classroom is ask them what matters, um, what matters to you, what matters to the world. And we did this in Perry County as well. And then just build off of that. We did a lot of like hook activities and, you know, little writing little scripts. And then the manifesto video, which is the last one, is 27 people's tiny scripts all pushed together through Google Docs and we were all sitting around on computers typing on the same Google Doc and throwing this um, script together and Daniel and I both do that in our classrooms. For me, I think the prompts are really important, but you have to be very aware um, that you aren't shifting their opinion through the prompt. I think that that's one reason that I don't say project-based learning because the teacher creates the question and then the students only get to work within the ramifications of that question. Um, so creating prompts that are big enough to really allow them um, the space, man, to figure themselves out and make mistakes and make videos that are only get going to get 30 views. But also yeah. then when they're super interested, like Daniel's kids were so passionate about Coney um, and they got it. They understood the message. They wanted to be a part of it. And then they got connected. I mean, Invisible Children contacted them and then came to their school. That's It's just like during the Perry County Project, Terry Sewell um, who's the representative for Perry County. We got in contact with her with Twitter. She did a live Twitter chat with us an hour before our culminating event to present all their videos to their community. Um, so I know we kind of got off topic with the camp, but... We're all over the place. It's cool. <laughs> that's, that's the only way we work. <laughs> yeah. And a, another piece that content creates... Go ahead, Paul. No, I, I guess it does seem like video was really important um, as as one of the tools that you were working with in the summer? Is that yeah, it, scripting I, and videos? Is that Yeah, I think it's I think it's a huge piece. And and you know, I, I'm very, very attached to video and the, the, the usage of it for our modern learning and our modern self expression. Um, I think that you know when you can take humanity online in any way, then then you're then you're working in the right direction. And I think video is the most effective way to do that. Um, we're losing FaceTime, we're losing mannerisms, we're losing body language, we're losing things like that. And our students have a really hard time in their adolescent years um, really expressing that kind of side of them because they're very, very, very physical beings, but they've become text beings. And so we find that um, there's a hashtag, Power of Video, on Twitter that everybody should probably check out. Um, Power of Video is just all about how video... Um, allows our students to translate real human um, messaging, uh, and, and it's 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 not the only way, but for especially for teenagers, it's, it's just a really really effective way. Um, also, when a student <laughs> looks at you and says something, actually looks at you and says something, it really hits, you know. Mm -hmm. How, how many like um? But the quality of those, like the lighting, is pretty wonderful. The, you know, well, their, you know. the, their their enunciation is pretty wonderful. Like, did, did were there many takes? Were there how did you know? Daniel, can I say something about? I would I would love anybody that's watching this to watch day one through day five. 
day one was, and this is, Daniel has a lighting kit because this is a part of what he does, but my students' videos are all created with just an iPad um, and a, we can pop in what the little hook thing we use, which is 30 bucks on the internet called a clip. Um, but please watch day one to day five. Day one is three prompts. They wrote on three prompts. They reflected. They talked to each other. They talked to themselves. And we recorded it. And then when we get to day five, it's scripted and it's it's put together. But it was maybe two takes from each student. Um, mm. And the whole time that we were editing, we were teaching some of the students that were interested how to edit. And then if you weren't is interested in editing, then we were doing something else. And some of them were outside. And um, But... Daniel can speak on that. He's this really eloquent way of saying it, but everything was recorded on an iPad. And everything I've ever learned to do with video, with the exception of little things Daniel has taught me, I've learned from Twitter and I've learned from reading stuff on the internet and watching YouTube videos and teaching myself. Uh, I've never had any, you know, classes or practice with that. Well, I had a question. If, if yeah. I can kind of pose one, I'm, I'm, I'm curious because I do a lot of, uh, I, I didn't mention this, but I sit on the board of Real Life Poets, how me, me and Beth kind of, I guess, I guess we know each other a little. Mm -hmm. uh, John Paul, I work with him, and, and we do a lot of uh, poetry workshops, writing workshops. We uh, Sunday we had a workshop, went down to the Edmund Pettus Bridge, across the bridge, did a workshop down there. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious because a lot of the things that we do is, like when we walk into a workshop, we don't have any prompts. Like a lot, like what the kids end up with is what the kids come up with. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of the content, like I, I just give you one example. I had some students in my class who who found out how to make a bracelet on, on Pinterest, and she wanted to. She started making the bracelets, showed classmates how to make the bracelets, and she was like, "Well, I want to sell the bracelets, and I want to sell the bracelets in order to raise money for." Uh, the Cancer Society, because I have an uncle that's su suffering from cancer. And so they made like a presentation to go uh, show the principal to see if they can sell them at the school. But there was they came up with it. And I'm curious to know, other than what, what, what you guys, because to me it sounds like it's a lot of go global issues and a lot of national uh, themes, right? Uh, but I know like I personally know more about national politics than local politics, but I'm probably more affected by the local politics. So I'm curious to know like what what type of things do you notice or do you notice any student generated um, issues that they try to tackle after getting the experience of, of, of how to Twitter bomb somebody or, or how to get some some a bigger entity to come in. How do they use the, the, what they've been empowered with to help their current local situations like closer to home or, or does, does that happen? One of the coolest things they've done, um, Jonathan and Javarius made a video um, on health in Perry County, and they used we. One thing that we did was left them with an iMac and Final Cut Pro and an iTunes card, so they could buy whatever apps they wanted for editing. Um, and they that video, Jonathan and Javarius recorded, created, got with other students, had the idea, talked to their superintendent about it. It's on their Facebook. I don't think it's on a YouTube, but it has a couple thousand views, and it's all about. Um, health awareness within their community. Obesity is an issue there, something that they're passionate about. So that's an example of local. And I also think um, everything in the camp was local. Everything in the camp was talking about what needs to happen in Perry County. What do you want to see happen? Um, it's just Daniel and I's belief that local problems are global problems. And we want to help our students realize that um, they are connected citizens in three ways, locally, digitally, and globally. So when we when we say that global perspective, we're saying that within working in a local um, area, because that's what makes sense and that's where they're initially connected. But it's empowering them to realize that these tools can connect their local issues to national and global issues as well. Um, and I'll be happy to tweet you that video, that the health video they made. Alan, I would love for you to get connected with students that are um, in the camp and tweet them and ask them those questions um, too, because I think it's important to hear it from them. And another another thing, um, like recently, you know, we're in Alabama. We're having a, a pretty big debate um, in the legislature about right. uh, college career readiness uh, right. and Common Core. Right. And so there's a big there's a big push against those things. And um, the other day, Kathy Gassenheimer and Thomas Raines at Alabama Best Practices um, skyped with my students. And the the idea was maybe we inform them and then maybe they take action. And so we skype with them for an hour and a half, and then we talked about it the next day for another hour and a half. And they could they just couldn't draw that passionate connection. 
And I, so I, I didn't, I didn't force it. So, you know, there, that's a, that's a huge piece there. Um, we can't make them care about things. Uh, not, not really. Um, sometimes things in the legislature need to stay in the legislature or in, or in the adult world. I don't know. But in that particular instance, it was really hard for me. I wasn't even going to attempt to convince them to care but, about this local but, piece. But, I mean, and, and on, on that particular thing, like, like, how do you feel about it? Well, not necessarily how do you feel about it, but them not reacting passionately, like, did that surprise you? Like, I guess, did you want them to? Did you think they would? Or, well, like, you, what, was their reaction different from what you thought it would be? No, I, I totally anticipated them um, not totally getting it. Uh, it's a really, really complex issue. They don't know where we came from, and they don't know where we are, and they don't know where we're going because nobody talks to them about standards. Nobody talks to them about educational law. Um, and so it was really hard for them to decipher the difference between Alabama course of study and Common Core. Um, they see it as a list of items of things they're supposed to learn. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a disconnect. I mean, you know, it, it's really hard for them to care. And I anticipated them. Um, I mean, some of them cared. A lot of them cared. But it's not, they didn't have, like, something to say about it, you know? These are, these are ninth graders? Or uh, I, I teach 9 through 12 in the same class. Okay. Pretty evenly don't distributed. Think, don't you think you could say that a lot of, about a lot of adults? I mean, it's gotten so ridiculous that it is hard to... I think of David Weinberger's Too Big to Know. I mean, it's gotten to that point that we've decided these are the things we need to know, and it's so big that anybody can't keep up with it. So, so now I'm thinking of Jonathan walking, this is what we need. We really need to be quiet enough to listen to them because they're going to take us places outside of that legislative room where it's just a bunch of big words, you know. They're going to make us stop and look at a sign and question what does the sign really mean and, and you know, should we fix the sign. So not, that's one thing that I absolutely... You said it, Monica. Yeah. About what you guys are doing is being quiet enough to listen without an agenda, you know. It's not like come in this room with all these people and tell them what you think. It's... Mm -hmm. What do you think? Just in the raw, what do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Beth and I talk frequently about tokenizing student voice. You know, do we, do we you know, how wrong does that feel, you know? So I, I can't tokenize their voice on Common Core. Or on anything, to be or fair. Or on anything, you. yeah. And I think that's the most, are you open, are you alive, and are you willing to listen? Um, and... Yeah, and that's what I, Al, that's kind of too what I was getting at with like the question prompts. That's why I kind of project-based learning stresses me out in the traditional classroom because the teacher creates the question. So I've been, and I talked to a lot of teachers about this, how do you um, open up your classroom within, you know, all this pressure you have, especially if you're Title I and, you know, all these other things to really give them a real learning environment where they get to make mistakes and they get to say, hey, I'm interested in this. But wait, Miss Sanders, now I'm interested in this and I'd like to look at this. I'd like to create this because of this. I'd like to write this because of this. How, um, you know, how do you do that in a public classroom when it is all these standards? I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but I know that we are trying um, to do that. Our, our best attempt at that is to embed those standards into where their passions lie. But I think like a lot, like with, with the with the Common Core specifically, uh, I mean, just, and this is just my take on it, um, this is like a, a lot of what's in the Common Core is already being done. It's, it's best practices. It's, it's they've, they've worded it with a bunch of $100 words uh, describing here is what kids are supposed to be able to do and not necessarily specifically around you know, this standard, like, it, like to me, it's almost like our current course of study is here is what the teacher will teach. And the common core is more here is what the students will display if. And so it's kind of student focused around student behavior. And, and, and if these things are present, uh, we can kind of uh, interpret more about the understanding. Because I think a lot of times, traditionally, assessments they assume, make assumptions of student understanding based on correct answers. And a lot of times, just because they got the answer right doesn't mean they understood any of the underlying principles behind getting that answer. They may have just learned an algorithm or a trick to get an answer, but then hadn't really dug deeper. Uh, but I think if you actually look at what 
I guess, quote unquote, good teachers do or what best practices kind of suggest that the Common Core is is already being implemented or, or more. If, if the only thing you do as a teacher or an educator is meet state standards, you, you, you probably need to think about raising whatever bar you're, you're meeting at that point, I think. I was wondering, and as uh, we're getting up toward closing time here, but if uh, I could ask you to reflect on, and now there's a way for you to do this too, I think, but reflect on the summer experience. And Beth, you're a social studies teacher, correct? Yes. Yeah, so, um, and you in particular, like how is the way you teach back in your school similar or different from your summer experience? And then how did your summer experience help you grow or learn as a teacher? So. Um, I think I think well when Daniel and I introduced ourselves we introduced ourselves as learners we don't introduce ourselves as teachers or educators I only say my content because it's like this you know way for people to kinda begin to get to know you but um, mm -hmm. I think so I'm saying that to say that every situation I go into I go into the situation as a learner I mm -hmm. genuinely believe that my students are teachers and that my students are learners and that I am a teacher and I am a learner and every single day in the camp and in my classroom I'm trying to instill this idea of a partnership and that they have much as much to give and as Monica will argue more to give if we would just listen a little better um, and so for me it was from the camp it was being more aware of student voice and what that looks like being mm -hmm. more aware of content creation that is not um, being buffered by me and by this I did I did essential questions my first two years of teaching I did very um, what I would call traditional project and inquiry based learning this whole year since the camp and since meeting meeting people like Monica and being open opened up to what real democratic education can look like in a classroom it has been so much more about sitting down and talking to my students one-on-one -on -one and listening to their passions and how can we whatever passion they have figure out how to make that work within a social studies classroom um, but also fighting very hard to take those walls down of my classroom mm -hmm. um, it's a to me it's about being connected to yourself being connected to whatever mentor or person you're, or people you're working with being connected to that to your device and then whatever work you're doing putting that work out to the world as your art and um, for better or worse and a lot of mistakes. Uh, yesterday I tweeted, man, we're just going to have to try again tomorrow, and I'm sorry, and I thank you for doing this with me, you know, I because we're experimenting a lot, um, and some days are really hard, and I also have administrators that are open, but are also, you know, being told that if we don't pass these standardized tests, then we're not doing right by the kids, and my heart is saying, standardized tests are not doing anything for them or aren't going to support them so I'm trying to um, throw some bows within my within the system because I my kids need people that are going to be advocates for their voice and God my kids are being advocates for my voice um, so mine too learning I just being immersed Paul and all I know is I know nothing um, and willing to just try everything that isn't anything industrialized. And if I could, before we come back to Daniel on that, um, I just wanted to alert Al, you know, I, as you talked about the poetry workshops, I'm, I'm guessing that that looks a little different than your classroom looks like, and I just wondered if that's true and how you compare those two. Well, like, in, in my classroom, I'm at work. And so I got a list of standards and, and, and expectations and protocol that I have to follow. Uh, but as much as I can, when, when, when students, like I, I have students, I, I have some, I really should, and, I, and hopefully if my administrators are watching, they'll, they'll, uh, put, they'll know my tongue is in my cheek. But I probably should write my lesson plans after I teach as opposed to writing, because those are my plans. But a lot of times my students come up with genuinely better ideas. i give you an example. This week. Uh, we were on persuasive writing, and I had a student that said, "Well, I'm right. I want to write a persuasive paper to the to the principal because I think it's not fair how they're doing this coin drive this week. I, I I think that it's not fair because the classes that bring the most money are getting certain prizes, and it's really not fair." And I was like, "I will write it with you. Let's let's us let's us write that paper. Let's do that. That's not on my agenda, 
but mm -hmm. you are using your voice to to empower change and so that happens a lot uh in in the summertime like this this summer for example the tornado hit a couple of years ago so a lot of the kids we were working with they genuinely were just writing they know people that they lost they some of them lost their homes or whatnot and so they started writing these stories and these 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 poems about that experience and so out of that we collected all of them there's a book coming out this summer an anthology of their poems sponsored by the library we didn't think of that. They created that. So a lot of it's more directed towards what the kids come out with. Sometimes we'll have a movie or a film. Sometimes we'll have songs. Sometimes we'll have a show. We want to put on a show. So we'll find a venue and put on a show. So we just kind of in, in the summer times, we just try to fuel and support whatever they want to do. And how do you do that in the summertime? What, what, under what? institution do you work or how do you uh real, real life poets uh has some partnerships with like the birmingham library uh with with uh, different um other social programs but basically the library and different schools that we have relationships with uh cool. they, they may already have like a summer program going on they'll invite us in like on a wednesday so all wednesdays are real life poets day and we'll come in once a week there or twice a week somewhere else or something like that so we kind of support ongoing youth programs in the summer okay and Daniel, I, just your thoughts on sort of the difference or similarity between summer and regular school and what you learned from the summer, um, if that makes sense. <laughs> no, it makes sense. Um, where I'd like to go here is, um, first of all, I learned a lot. We, we, we used some amazing strategies, and we allowed them to guide us. And something that I learned is that you have to know when to say, you're ready, now go create. Um, and I'll tell you really quickly what happened there. This, this semester, a student came and peeked over my shoulder and was looking at a lesson plan that I was writing, and it said empathy strategy. And it had this, like, two-paragraph thing of empathy strategy. And he looked at me and he said, are, are we really doing that again? And, and it, made me, it made me stop and think. You know, it's not that he was reluctant to do it, but what I realized, I, I actually deleted it from my lesson plan because what I realized was these kids are, they are capable of feeling, and they do feel, and they're ready to share. And so, like, once they're kind of awakened and given an opportunity to be awakened, then you have to be responsible and reasonable enough as a facilitator and as a learner and as a partner to say, okay, you're, you're right. You know what? No more openness. We're open. Let's go, let's go show the world how open we are. And so it's, you have to know when to stop preaching that, stop sharing that, stop doing that, and actually communicate. And so that's a big piece here. Um, that's one thing that I learned uh, kind of the hard way. I drove it too hard. I beat a dead horse. And so once that happened, uh, the, the other thing I wanted to talk about here and this happened in Perry County, and it's happening now at my school. Mm -hmm. um, positive content creation is an avenue to freedom as an educator. By that, I mean if I and my students work together to create a positive product to share with the world, whether it's a community piece about disabled citizens or whether it's a piece about Coney, which is more global, it doesn't really matter because it's positive. It's showing that the students care and that they feel and that they're willing to share. And then the world, including their parents, views that product. Then that product, then those parents and community members say, we love that. We want more of that. And then it goes in this cycle. And I think Monica actually did an infographic one time about this. So the positive content gets created by the student. The community sees it, tells the board that they love it. And then the board says, hey, principals, can you get your teachers to do more of this? And so all of a sudden... We're less tied down. We're less constrained. And we as educators, Beth and I have actually kind of earned our freedom, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of teachers can do that a lot more often. You earn your freedom by creating positive content and by sharing positive information and, and emotion. Can I say one thing about real life poets, just to be very clear? Um, I've never, I, that was my first, I was a first year teacher, and I went to a free workshop with six students and met John Paul, and it was the first time that I realized what student voice could be, and um, 
from it's been so huge. So I just wanted to give out a shout out to that because we need to link that somewhere because it is it is really powerful what is happening in Birmingham and what student voice looks like through this beautiful artistic thing and um, needed to say that. Very cool. Uh, lots of inspiring things here at the end. Um, thank you all so much. Um, but we should give each other a break and um, and come to an end. Monica, you have anything to add at the end? or? No, it, I think we said it. Plenty. Yeah, I think so too. So next week, um, we will be, um, David Leutz is coming on with a year at Mission School, um, which is another video project, um, and it'll be great to uh, talk to him and, and see what all that um, is about. Um, I won't be here, but Monica and Chris Sloan will uh, make it all happen. Um, and so that'll be very cool with David Lutz. Thank you all. Um, we, we do want to say that um, our video project here is um, was started um, with Jeff Lebo and um, Dave Cormier. Um, and this will go up pretty fast up on YouTube. And then it'll, um, a little bit later, when I do a tiny bit of editing here and there, go out as a podcast um, at edtechtalk.com um, and at teachersteachingteachers.org. And um, edtechtalk.com is a channel of the World Bridges Network. Um, and Al, come on over. We'd love to have you in that network. I'll, <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll be we'll, there. I'll be there. We'll be talking. Okay. Great. I hope so. So um, thank you all. And Thanks, good night. Guys. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Al. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Monica. Bye, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.